Okay. Uh, for those of you that are uh, on virtually, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Hopefully, you can hear me. Um, I'm Alan Matsumoto, the past chair of the department. Uh, I'm going to have to take the opportunity to uh, introduce the Reed Omri. He's our 15th Charles J. Tuck, uh, Tuck Pegmeyer lecturer. His talk will be on From Bedside to Biosphere Embracing Planetary Health in Healthcare. So, uh, before I do this, um, we'll have him, before we start, I want to tell you a little bit about the Pegmar lectureship. Let's see if this is advancing. It's not not advancing. Shell is not advancing. So let's see if we can advance this one. Yes. May have to use the mouse. Um, so Dr. Pegmar is a picture of Tuck. Uh, when he's uh, been here for a while, but he came to the University of Virginia in 1972. And in 1973, he started our IR Rad Tech program. They graduated their first class in 74. Uh, so this year we're celebrating 50 years of the Tegmar's uh, Rad Tech School. He was a very uh, serious individual. He loved smoke, uh, smoking his pipe and drinking Diet Pepsis. Um, we walked over to his old office in those days, it was before packs and everything. He used to have to run the films from the hospital over to his office, over by where my office is now. So, so Suki, if you were a fellow back then, you would have had to take the films, run them from the IR suite, which was over in the hospital, over there. He'd look at them on those view boxes. If he didn't like and say, go do a 15 degree oblique and then come back and bring it. It was an interesting experience. He's well known for fibromuscular dysplasia and renal artery angioplasty. This is a picture of the old cut film aortogram, and you see the renal artery angioplasty. And he developed a lot of the new technology involved uh, with angioplasty. This is Dr. Pegmar with uh, one of his fellows, the woman in the white there was uh, Lori Bittner, and she was an IR fellow in the 80s. So he was very progressive recruiting women. The uh, other woman with the letter on is a tech. He always wore his tongue lead. He always said it's tough walking on water and always being Superman because I always have to bail you junior people out. So I have to kind of um, he, he developed a lot of technologies I talked about. This is an example of a pen wire that he developed, but through a guiding cap, it was a very novel concept. Prior to that, we were using balloons on seven French catheters through eight French sheaths and the residents and fellows would have to manually hold all those big holes. Um, he also had a great sense of humor. He could light up a room. He would go from very solemn to very, very uh, pointed as he's sitting there here. He used to use the pipe smoke as a tactic to get people to do what he wanted to do. So he'd call a meeting into his office after he'd been smoking a pipe for about 10 minutes and then he said he would use that as a tactic to try to get what he wanted because people's eyes were burning so much that they'd give it to an answer. But he also liked to die of Pepsi. This is uh, the fellows back then. There's Fritz when he was a fellow. And when I was a junior attending, Dr. Tegmar playing a golf tournament. It started pouring rain, thundering, but we were losing to the fellows. Tegmar was a very competitive person, refused to walk off the course even though they were sounding the sirens. And he would not let us get off the course until we caught up and tied the fellow. We were stoked at this time, and they, they were out there looking for us, but he would not let us leave. But we were tied, we didn't lose, but we were soaking wet. We were probably really stupid because we could have probably got hit by lightning. We also ran over Andy's ball, so it really wasn't tied. Yeah. <laughs> we had one of our fellows was a scratch golfer from Texas, and he kept running over his ball, so it got matched on the ground. And Andy would say, I can't hit that. And Tech said, I don't, I don't know what he's so on. <laughs> he was a fisherman. He loved to fish. And the story has it that in 1978, he went over to Switzerland with his fishing equipment, and, and, and he meant to train with Dr. Bunsey. And there was a guy that made handmade balloons who loved to fish, too. So he traded all of his fishing equipment to this person in exchange for balloons. And he came back with a suitcase full of angioplasty balloons. In the 1978, he did his first iliac angioplasty from balloons that he got by training for his fishing equipment. 
Dr. Tegmar passed away in 1996 at the young age of 56, and we uh, started up this lectureship in his honor. So a little bit about Reed Omri. He received his MD from Northwestern University and his master's in epidemiology from UVA. He completed his residency, although it says he was here from 93 through 97. He was here from 92 through 97. And he's a, a vascular interventional radiology fellowship at Northwestern, after which he spent a few years at University of Wisconsin-Madison and joined the faculty at Northwestern, where he'd been there, was there a long time. He's a highly NIH-funded clinician scientist, published extensively, and really performed pioneer, pioneering research in MR-guided interventions. <clears throat> he was recruited to Vanderbilt in 2013 be serve as their chair, a position he held until this past July. And this since that, he has now taken a year of sabbatical to do sustainability in healthcare research. In his role at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, in addition to being chair of the department, he was chair of their board for the Vanderbilt Medical Group. He co-led Vanderbilt's strategic planning effort and founded the Medical Innovators Development Program for Vanderbilt School of Medicine. He has served as president of the Association of University Radiology and was president-elect of the Society of Chairs of Academic Radiology. Reed is a great friend of many of us here, many people. Uh, he also launched the uh, Green Leap, a blog for sustainable healthcare. And at this last year's SCARD meeting, he took a picture with those of us. There's me on the right. There's our new chair, Colin Dane. And then Reed's right in the smack in the middle next to Jennifer Harvey, who's now chair of Rochester, but she was a faculty member here and chief of us. And then Tally Alton, who was the research resident right behind Reed, who's now chair at the University of Missouri. So again, this is his uh, website, the blog, www.readomery.com. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Reed talking about the bedside to biosphere embracing planetary health and healthcare. Reed. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. And thank you, everyone. It's such an honor. Can you all hear me okay? It's such an honor to be back at UVA. And uh, I, I have such fond memories here and spending uh, spending so much time in the hospital, spending time also with, uh, with Stuart in the, uh, in the lab and uh, getting to know Charlottesville. It's a wonderful place to, to live. Uh, I also want to thank uh, everyone that is uh, is here virtually. I know sometimes you feel left out and we do want this to be uh, an inclusive uh, uh, discussion. Alan, I'm so indebted to you uh, as during my interventional radiology days at, uh, at Northwestern and to Prince. Uh, it was because of, of you both believing in me that I ended up choosing interventional radiology as a, as a career. Um, to all the residents, I uh, I said this earlier, uh, you're just training at a fantastic, fantastic place. Um, we uh, today are gonna talk about climate change. We're gonna talk about sustainability. We're gonna talk about planetary health. Uh, none of this uh, is going to be in any way on the uh, American Board of Radiology Acceleration. Uh, so trigger warning there. What I will say is though, what we're gonna talk about affects every single person in this room, every single person in the state of Virginia, and every single person in the world right now. So this, uh, this is a topic for me, when I think back, what was it? It was during lockdown. I don't know if you all go back to that traumatic time. Um, and uh, for me, it was in April. And I came to the, the realization that what was occurring in one part of the world uh, affected another, even though they were geographically continents away or states away. And what occurred with the decision of one person also affected others. We all, uh, back in April, we we had heard what was happening in New York City. Well, it started in uh, 
in Seattle, New York was was just blowing up with with COVID. We also had heard in Italy what was happening, and yet this this was we we didn't know how to manage. One of my neighbors at that time uh, said that she based her um, uh, how scared and anxious she needed to be during the height of COVID based on how I interacted with my family. She said that if I went for a walk with my kids and my wife, we joked around, she was like, oh yeah. But if I was walking like the living dead, she was like, oh no, I'm in trouble. So I realized actually how much we in medicine impacted uh, others beyond the confines of our medical centers. And as I was in the midst of COVID, I realized, oh my goodness, uh, you know, we're gonna somehow get through COVID. There's at some point gonna be a vaccine, but really COVID was an opportunity, it was a laboratory to understand how we might want to address the climate crisis. And I, I told myself at that point that I was going to start diving into this and I was going to do it in stealth mode. And I was going to learn everything I could on the slot. It was going to be a side hustle. Because obviously if I brought this up in the midst of COVID, people would say, why are you doing it? But for me, it was a way to actually connect with others. And I learned, and the more I looked into this, the more I realized we had the opportunity in medicine to transform uh, everyone. And uh, not just uh, those that we were taking care of in our clinics, but our entire communities and uh, also subsequent generations. So that's how I got started in this. And I, uh, as, as Dr. Matsumoto mentioned, I did step down from being chair after a decade and I ended a career pivot into sustainable health care. And uh, I chose to go into academic medicine because I felt it was the way to have the biggest impact that I could. I chose to be a chair because I thought I could have an even bigger impact. And now I'm, uh, I'm moving into planetary health, which I'm going to talk about because I, I know that's a way to have even bigger impact. What I want to share with you is a framework for that and why this is important and the immense opportunity that everyone here has uh, to make a difference. Have to use the little bowl. There we go. A uh, couple of disclosures. All right. I want to start here with uh, the Ravana Reservoir. And Dr. Matsumoto sent me this uh, sent me this picture. And I don't think I ever fished, them. but I do know from Dr. Matsumoto that this was punks fishing hole. And uh, was it every uh, every Wednesday afternoon? He would come into this. He lived right nearby, and he uh, as one of uh, like a really renowned angler. This was his place, and I I want to uh, start and bookend everything today with the respect for Dr. Tegmeyer and everything he taught me. I was really lucky as a resident. His commitment to taking care of patients was unparalleled. We were here to serve. And it was part of the culture, it was a part of the culture throughout the department. But that's what I latched onto, and that's why I ended up going into interventional radiology. So I need to thank Dr. Tegmeyer for all he did to help me. But he also, if we think about it, Dr. Tegmeyer was out there, he was in nature, but he cared about what was happening in nature. And so uh, I certainly never had a conversation with him about the environment. But I, uh, I do know that Dr. Tegmeyer uh, cared about uh, what nature uh, was, uh, how it, allowed fish and all species to survive and understood the 
uh, the interaction. So what I would like to do for today is I would like to dedicate this lecture to the legacy of Dr. Tegmach. Uh, I also, I want to dedicate it to everyone here who has a child or grandchild. Because ultimately, what we're going to be talking about is to try and help them. And so let's uh, let's think about Dr. Tegmar, and let's also think about children and all subsequent generations. So what we're going to discuss today is our way of telling them that we knew what was happening. We did everything good to help uh, develop a better health through the plan. Uh, I started with a lake here, probably what, 10 miles from here. We're now going to go about 500 miles north, just outside of Toronto. And there's this Crawford Lake. Has anyone heard of Crawford Lake? It's a you know, how would uh, how would somebody in Toronto have heard about the Ravenna Reservoir? Well, this lake is uh, actually internationally renowned. It's internationally renowned for a couple of reasons. One is this lake is structured so that the water doesn't move. There's no turnover like there is in the usual lake. And because of that, this is an incredible laboratory to understand what has actually happened over the and geologists, when they uh, when they want to understand uh, different geologic time periods, they bore into the earth, and then they take that sample and they image it with their fancy techniques to try and gauge the different um, time uh, eras. Sort of like imaging of sediments or rocks. Well, same thing is been done here at Crawford Lake, going down onto the, uh, the base of the lake. And this is considered ground zero for the Anthropocene. And just, uh, how many of you have at least heard this term? Anyone? Just like, just stuff, uh, okay. So Anthropocene is the, uh, it's the era of human and what it is, it's a geological construct that says we humans have actually changed the geology planet. Uh, that's pretty fascinating if you think about it, because now you can look into something that isn't living, and you can you can say that. Uh, life has actually affected something that's physical. Uh, so this concept is going through the rounds of geologists, and it's been a, a 20 year already, probably about five more years before it formally gets like, and the Anthropocene, when we could actually take a sample of sediment from this lake and say humans were actively here causing a force in nature is going to 1950 because of Tony instead of and so the nation the notion of the anthropocene is that humans are a force of nature okay we change geology but we actually don't want to change geology we change how other Living animals survive and how they interact with the world. We are one species, over two million that have been identified. And I'm going to show you now through a video about how animals view us humans. Okay, I'm going to show you some research that was done on the South African animal culture. Uh, these ecologists who wanted to see if animals were uh, afraid of the human voice and how that compared to, say, 
a lion's roar or a gunshot. So I'm going to show you a video. What the researchers did is they took human voices and they put them up uh, and they just played them at 60 decibels to see how different animals would respond to a just normal human voice. And they compare that to a lion's roar and a gunshot. So you're going to see it this wild and uh, this animal uh, or what happens. Got up. These are the actual voices that they're hearing. So uh, the animals were more afraid of a regular human voice than they were of a lion's roar. And what I found most amazing is they were more afraid of the human voice than even a gunshot. So we affect other living species, whether or not we recognize them. And that's one of the, the, the key concepts of planetary health is that the health of the planet includes all living species, not just humans. And then it also includes all the, uh, the geology that helps serve the human of the, the, the species. So we're all interconnected and the health of the planet affects the health of humans. So I'm gonna show you some data support that. So the World Health Organization has called climate change the single biggest threat to humanity. It's not COVID. It's not another pandemic. It's actually climate change. I'm going to go over some of the data so we can understand why. Um, we have all seen in the news the, the various extreme climate events that have occurred. Uh, this is just in the last, in 2023, Hawaii, unfortunately. Uh, I spoke with uh, one of our previous residents in IR uh, fellows, Lee Miyasato, and I contacted Lee after the Hawaii wildfire. He said what wasn't actually shown is uh, that there are a lot of, uh, uh, there, there were kids who were at home with parents and news. So the utter, utter tragedy of the deaths there. Uh, we have the apocalyptic view of New York City. Uh, was anyone in the Bay Area when the Bay Area looked all orange? Uh, so this New York City, uh, where was the wildfire? Was it right in Central Park? Does anyone remember where the wildfire was? It's in Canada. Okay. So uh, if we think about it, there's a wildfire in Canada, and it makes New York City look like the Apocalypse. Um, I want to get back to this concept of just like COVID, how climate change in one part of the world affects another. So uh, since I was a kid, I have had asthma. I'm on a steroid inhaler. I have 12 year old twins. My boy, when he was five, had asthma, had to be admitted to the hospital, you know, lost Sarah. His twin sister was fine. She was fine. 
until the smoke from this wildfire came down into Nashville and caused our air quality to feel pretty hot. She ended up going on the steroids. So this isn't just a abstract. This affects all of us. And uh, if we look at Florida, we know, uh, I don't know if there's anyone down in Florida this summer, the water, it's like 100 degrees. That's, that's, that just affects the health of the entire uh, ocean. So when we, when we think about climate change, what does it really do? And I just, I want to come out, I want to say directly, um, climate change predominantly is due to fossil fuels. There is a disinformation campaign that big oil is doing to try to place this in a, we're not sure, that playbook is exactly the same playbook as what? Tobacco. Like, identical. Okay? And so, if you look, the arguments are the exact same. Uh, well, if something's uh, so bad for you, why doesn't everybody get kids? Well, that's not how it works. Right? Uh, but if we actually look at the effect of, uh, of fossil fuels today, the, the number of people whose deaths are attributed to fossil fuels is somewhere between 3.5 and 7.5 million. Why? These numbers are staggering. And when you hear those numbers, you think it's, it's like it's that classic thing where it's, with Stalin, you kill one person, like it's said, it's 20 million people don't eat. These are staggering numbers. We are in the business of healing. This should not be okay for anybody who is in medicine. I don't want my daughter to have asthma. And I guarantee there are people in this room that will have family members who are affected by climate change or you will directly be affected because it, it affects everyone, especially the most vulnerable. And uh, who are the vulnerable? Every single person in this room was a vulnerable person at once. Child, like my kids, you're vulnerable. You're over age 65, you're vulnerable. You are more uh, at risk for extreme weather events. You are more at risk for the, uh, you know, frankly, because you don't have the ability to tolerate these, these events. So do not think of vulnerable as being just someone else. If any of you have parents or grandparents, you know, pretty cool. They're depending on their age, they're gonna. And then if you add a, a coexisting disease, if you add uh, there, there can be the, uh, vulnerability based on socioeconomic and other uh, other measures. So let's recognize that then when we consider the health of the planet, we also want to consider the health of our communities and how much from equity perspective. Few, few background numbers here. Paris Agreement, 2015. Nations come together and say we want to limit the rise of uh, the average global temperature from 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. Do you hear that? Well, first of all, most Americans, even if you're in medicine, Really sure, you don't want to quite say it. Like, so much of 1.5 degrees centigrade in Fahrenheit. When I was at RSNA, I asked five different physicians. No, no, no. 
actually my uh, uh, my son was closer to getting in this position. I heard the position say, so, and it would be like, I have no idea. Like, these are just numbers that don't mean anything. When you, when you see it, like, one point, it doesn't sound like a lot. You know, it's like 79 retail and weight class. Like, oh, that is maybe it's, it's actually 2.7. Okay, it's 2.7 degrees. So it doesn't sound like a lot. But I want you to think instead that as this goes up, Really, what we are doing is we are leading to more deaths. We are also leading to more migration that needs to occur. Uh, because we are leading to more hunger. We are serious. Uh, the U.S. is 8.5 percent of uh, the healthcare is 8.5 percent of emissions. Uh, it's about half that globally. So, what does that mean? Uh, Fritz, we were having fun talking about uh, the importance of not shaming people. And uh, one way that climate folks uh, unintentionally shame people is for hopping on an airplane. Like, oh, baby, so you came to Virginia, you hopped on an airplane, don't you? Like, first of all, let me just be really clear that does not work. Shaming people never works. When we shame people for not wearing one of these, do they magically say, oh my goodness, I should have, I, you were right, I was wrong. It does not work. So aviation, about 2% of overall emissions. So healthcare is double aviation. Gorgeous. So we in medicine, we do the good work of helping patients. We also spew out pollution and waste that affects the neighboring communities who are least able to tolerate this. And I assure you that the incinerators where our medical supply, our medical waste gets incinerated, are not in the same neighborhoods where physicians live. Okay, I just like, I want you to stop and think we do immense good. We're not in a position anymore. We no longer have the luxury to have that as a hall pass to say we get out of it. We don't need to worry about it because we do. We're the fifth largest emitter. We were a nation. And there's immense costs. And I want to I want to flip this to something I said earlier about that, you know, walk in the neighborhood. What's the most trusted profession in the world? Physicians. Okay. Number two, believe it or not, the scientists. Number three, are teachers. Uh, I know that in this room, we have a lot of people who actually feel crazy. We don't speak out then who. So we need to use that trust to make a difference. Uh, there was a paper that came out from Moore Brown's lead author, Kate Hanneman, uh, as a senior author uh, last year that talked about the health effects of climate change and also what we could do in radiology. I have a link here. This is a fantastic uh, article that they helped uh, lead. So there's a lot of information there. And I just wanna, I wanna focus on uh, when we think about radiology and we think about how much uh, energy we use, uh, basically it's MR and CT and the diagnostic uh, radiology. Those are where most of our uh, missions are coming from and where we can try to address them. I, I also want to now convert this and move from a, hey, what might we do about this? What might we do in healthcare? What, how might we make a difference? It's not enough just to talk about it. We actually need to act. And I think that's also one of the lessons that uh, when we look at what has happened over the last several years with diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. 
uh, we need to act and we 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 need to measure ourselves by the impact we generate. So how do we design for planetary health? Um, talked a little bit earlier this morning about leadership, but fundamentally leadership, it's, it's the concept, it's the way we influence change for good. And I used to say influence change, but then I realized I was way too naive. And there are people that want to influence change. So I wanted to put that at the, the end. And so sometimes uh, we need to show what's uh, not a good example of leadership. And, uh, you know, I think um, Dr. Matsumoto and, and Dr. Bangle, I want you to imagine what Dr. Tegmeyer would say if he saw what I'm going to show. This is at the, at the lewd. Okay, so uh, I want to call this out. This is not leadership. <laughs> if I was on the fence, okay, I'm in that I'm in that middle on caring about the environment. And then I, you know, I what pops up on my my phone? Oh, there's some soup that's tossed at the Mona Lisa. Didn't you see that movie? Like knocks out. And then, yeah, you know where the where the the dude accidentally you know, pulls up the phone. It's don't attack the Lisa. That's not that's not a strategy for success. And I want to call that out because the problem is that if we don't call out acts like this, then we get glommed on to this. Like, I have nothing, there's no, I have no connection to this group. What I am curious about is when they were deciding to toss the, the soup, did they choose vegan soup? What kind of soup, what soup did they toss? And they have a discuss like, like who does this? But unfortunately, it's happening more and more. Soup. And there was also some I'm making this up. Mashed potatoes. Who throws mashed potatoes at Monet's? We there's got to be another way, and I want to show you that way. It doesn't involve throwing. <laughs> Well, we're getting covered up there. All right, so my first ask, this is uh, what we really need to do is we need to understand the audience that we're trying to motivate. If we're going to lead change, you have to understand the needs of the audience. So you begin with empathy. Instead of talking, you begin by listening. You have to understand the needs. And the language matters. So uh, yes, I could I could show the 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 soup throwing video for a small segment of, of climate activists, and they go hell yeah, okay. But actually, they're not the people we need. So we have to think about whatever we're doing. How is it going to land? And I want to show a. Video the hammer this point home. Uh, is anyone a home brothers movie thing? Okay, now this is inside uh Lou and Davis. The setting is 1962, and you have a folk singer trying to 
sing his heart out to a potential manager. Take him under his wing and let his heart to scream flourish. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, we get this, and it's really, what's this movie? It's great. It's like 13. So he's singing. He's singing. Okay. So it starts slowing down, and... So what does the manager say? I don't see a lot of money here. And then we sing it to the manager. Does the manager, like, does he appreciate the gut wrench? Yes. But it's not what the manager wants. That's not what the manager needs. This, if we distill down to the greatest fail of climate activists, is this. It's not understanding the needs of the person you're trying to convince. And those needs vary. You have, you don't, remember with this, what was the, mis the mistake we made with this? It was really well-intentioned public health scientists saying we have to use a data-driven approach to public health, okay? And what ended up happening is using those words basically excluded a lot of things. When you're data driven, I don't trust, I don't trust. Okay. So we would have been way more successful had we had people who were trusted by those who didn't want to wear masks be the advocates. You don't believe me. Watch it. If you're on the, uh, the left side of the political spectrum, Imagine Ted Cruz says something. Let's imagine it's actually true. I don't believe it. You're on the right side of the political spectrum, and you hear something from someone on the left, you the same thing, You're not going to believe it. So we have to have trusted messengers, but we also need to understand what do people want? What are they looking for? I am looking for us how to <laughs> All right. So this is an example of what many people are looking for in healthcare. Can you show me an example of something we're doing actually? Better for the environment at the same time being economically viable. This was work from Jennifer Lindsay, one of our residents at Vanderbilt. She won the AUR Memorial Prize for top research. And she showed she showed that switching single-use disposable files. Think about your contrast agent purchasing it from Dollar General. It doesn't seem expensive. And so you're actually buying a lot versus purchasing your contrast agent from Costco, a giant. You're going to save money. You're going to save money. Well, how much money? Six CT scanners or half mil. Half mil. This actually, this raises attention. And while what, you don't even need to talk about the green benefits of reducing pharmaceutical waste or plastic waste, 
sometimes if you talk about the green benefits, it actually be counterproductive. Go right with the if you're getting what you want from the if you're getting a green benefit and there is a finance benefit, be with the finance benefit. Be way more successful. Second, fast uh, earlier to understand how climate change affects the most long. Uh, my ask for all of you is to link people and the planet. So said, let me say this differently. If you see a overall health equity strategy and it doesn't address emissions, it is not a complete strategy. Zip code accounts for 50% of health outcomes. Access to care, quality of care, like 20%. I want to say that again because this is a huge line uh, aspect for the health profession that's interested in equity. Do, do not understand. We have 150 different aims in our equity strategy, Vanderbilt's Medical Center. Not a single one of them addresses the waste that we spew on to the communities we're trying to serve. Not a single one of them. And I know that we're actually like the majority of medical centers. So here's an example of how to do it. Boston Medical Center. Boston Medical Center is opening a new hospital in an underserved area in Boston. They apply through the inflation reduction to put solar panels on them. They then, so they had that paid for by the government. Took the solar panels, then gave a prescription vouchers to physicians to take patients who are frequent flyers in the emergency room and give them vouchers for $50 off a month for their electricity. And they worked it out with the power company to ship. So all the, the electricity that they were getting from the vouchers came from the solar panels. Like that. That is incredibly great. Use federal funds to go green, and then you use physicians to give prescriptions for clean energy to patients. Yes. Give it back. Kudos. Um, my last ask is to promote the planetary. And you know, we've been talking about this. So planetary. If we think about medicine as only about human health, we are living um, in, a, uh, in an industry that is short arming us. The future of medicine uh, really needs to shift to not just human health but recognize the climate stuff. Because when we start to recognize that climate care is patient care, we start recognizing a whole new set of levers that we have to benefit the patients that we serve and the communities that we serve. And this concept decenters us as humans. And it will make it feel awkward. Probably feels just as awkward as somebody hearing uh, in Copernicus's time that the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. Yeah. Or somebody in Darwin's time. Wait, what do you mean humans weren't created? Uh, so when I say that, I say that because this is. This is how it works. The health of humans is connected to the health of humanity and vice versa. So for all of you residents, you have the opportunity to have an enormous impact. You used to say, oh, I want to go in, I want to go into uh, uh, cardiac imaging, I want to go into breast solution, I want to go into neuroimaging because I want to help 
all these people with these diseases, and that's great. You should still do all that. Uh, at the same time, if you start thinking from a planetary perspective, you have the ability to affect the lives of 8 billion people currently. That's so scale. So, so when we think about this, then the United Nations in 2015 came out with this 17 sustainable development goals. If you are interested in diversity, equity, inclusion, you're not familiar with this, please, please, please look this up. Um, this, these goals really tell us what we need to do and to use a yardstick to measure our impact. These goals are dangerous. And you know why I'm gonna tell you they're dangerous? Because the state of Tennessee legislature ban these goals, the use and generating policy in the state of Tennessee. These goals are so dangerous. No poverty problems. Can you imagine? But you know, the reason this was banned in Tennessee is there's a lot of value that can happen when we got policy on these goals. If you don't want anything to change, you know. If you want things to change, these are these are out there, and you can follow them, and you can track them. And uh, a lot of, uh, if you look at college courses, a lot of college courses will now say in their syllabus which holds their their course. So, I'd like everybody to be aware of this. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, close by going back to Dr. Tangmeyer. I went on this. Uh, there's a uh, a website that was developed uh, by uh, several entities in the United States to measure uh, climate and health risks by census tract. There's 70,000 census tracts. So I went back and I looked what is the risk of the Ravana Reservoir, Dr. Kegmeyer, vision to extreme climate events. It's actually, it's great. It's 90 first percent. It's considered extreme vulnerable. It's like Louisiana context. Uh, so I think uh, Dr. Tegmeyer would care deeply about wanting to continue his application fishing. And so I tried to then think about what a future would be like in the Ravana Reservoir if we considered planetary life. And I worked together with AI to imagine. And uh, we replaced the red of the extreme uh, with the red of the And I, uh, I do want to end by saying that we can do this. Um, we can address the health of the planet and the patients, uh, but only if we do this together. So I want to thank you. Thank you all for this opportunity. And it's a tremendous honor to come back to UVA. And it's a tremendous honor to be able to speak uh, under the uh, illustrious Dr. Peggy Marcos lecture. Thank you. Any questions, comments, thoughts for uh, Dr. Omer? I want to know who uh, Al is that does the work with you. Read Omer and Al. That one over well. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Any other thoughts? Um, it's like someone said something in the chat, so that might be. Is that you? Me inviting comment. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, I'll just, just ask a question of the audience here. How many of you think about uh, when you're at home and you thought about the waste that you 
generate or you think about uh so you can raise your hand uh, before today uh how many people also thought that that could come into work too good i'm glad to see it i hope more people today uh is if you are a resident and you are looking for a great way to grow your career, this is it, okay? You're basically, this is like 20, like 2017, and you're just getting into not just epidemiology, you're getting into public health. Right now, if we, uh, if, when we look at the estimates of how many people will be working in climate in 2030, right now only 1% of those people are. When I was served last uh, last night at the Ridley, my, uh, my server was a fourth year undergrad here, environmental science major, going to Georgetown, and it's gonna do environmental law, which is done. 25% of college graduates consider climate the single biggest issue. Uh, when we look in healthcare, two thirds of nurses are burnt out, 50% of radiologists, 25% of physicians are clinically depressed, one third of senior residents will not choose medicine again. And I stepped away this year and I started interacting with climate folks. It felt like I was going back in time when I entered medicine. There was this real sense of calling and this, uh, there was this, hey, we're here to do something bigger than ourselves. And I just noticed over the years, it hasn't, you know, it took a big bump during COVID, but there has been a increasingly a um uh there's been a tr much more transactional aspect of medicine and uh, there's no Illuminati trying to do it's just the system itself required is it, functioning on such race within margins um so whether you choose climate whether you choose DEI whether you choose AI whether you choose Find something that brings you joy. Find something that brings you meaning. Find something you know the world needs you and you can make a difference. I will continue to have that. So thank you for eight years. You know, I saw something like, oh no, there is a, I'm curious, you stand there in solar field, right? Um, a lot of, is from coal fired plants, liquid propane, or whatever. Um, we gotta we gotta create energy somehow. How do you, and if you have a solar field, you gotta have batteries, so now you're mining cobalt, you're mining nickel and lithium, which makes kind of a planetary mess in and of itself. What and nuclear power might be a clean way to go. What you talking about? To run the MRI. So I'm going to repeat, uh, repeat for everyone. So the, the 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 question is: given the uh, the depth and the scope of the energy transition, uh, going green is not uh, environmentally um, neutral. We have to mine and extract, and uh, we're end up with nuclear waste. Yeah, so so we're we're um, so a few things. So one is we're going to see a shift from uh, petro states, petro nations to electro nations. We're going to start seeing nations that uh, build their wealth off of. The natural resources used for batteries and the rest of the green transition. So, um, so that's going to happen. Of course, there's two trillion dollars sitting in certain assets. 
world. It, there isn't a, um, there's no easy solution. Uh, so what we have to do is in, uh, we have to consider the trade-offs and, you know, coming from an interventional radiologist perspective, we, we do therapies that may, uh, may have side effects. They're not, uh, and we just, we think that the benefits outweigh the risks, but it's not pure, it's not all good. We have to, we have to make trade-offs. And so nuclear is a classic example. Yeah. Yep. It's a great, great question. Thanks for bringing that up, Stuart. Any other thoughts? Anything? Um, typically, at the end of the Tegmeyer um, lecture, we uh, make a big deal, give you a wrap present. Um, the, the present is typically a picture of the rotunda with the Haiti Bach common cut over it, which coincidentally occurred the year we finished up the EPA in 1997. Rather than give it to you and figure out how you're going to get it home and all that. We're just going to have a direct ship to your home, but we'll do the pretend motion. <laughs> the the uh, print and the frames. So, uh, thank you for the great presentation. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everyone. Thank